Now, at that time on the domestic front in Australian politics, John Howard was losing ground. He was losing face in front of the Australian people. With his close association with a warmonger like George Bush, he was losing a lot of the popular vote. The Bali bombings was certainly one way to boost his credibility, one way to boost his numbers, to boost his popularity, to boost the fact that he stood up against those nasty Muslims who would dare to kill Australians. So here we're finally getting to the crunch of the matter, the Q Bono, who actually really did benefit from the Bali bombings. It certainly was not Jamar Islamir. It certainly was not the characters like Abu Bakr Bashir, who found himself suddenly being wanted by America and having his bad name even smeared even more by characters like Al Farouk, a well-known CIA agent who was doubling as a terrorist in Indonesia. The Australian Federal Police certainly also benefited from the event of Bali. They had sent a team within 24 hours, the first time ever Australia had ever mounted a joint investigation with Indonesia. One could say they were creating a foothold in Southeast Asia that had never been there before. They were certainly breaking new ground and introducing themselves as the police of the region that could move into any country regardless of anywhere. The first time ever that the Australian Federal Police had mounted a crime scene investigation with Indonesia. And of course since then we've seen a lot of cooperation between Australian Federal Police and the Indonesian authorities. In 2005 a case in point the Bali 9. The convicted drug smugglers convicted of trying to smuggle heroin into Australia. They were under close scrutiny by the Australian Federal Police and were seen as some kind of sacrificial lamb to try and butter up the Australian Indonesian police force relationship. Australian citizens paying the price for federal police relationships in Southeast Asia. And of course eyed with great suspicion by the average Indonesian person on the street. Yet another one, the ADF, also known as the Australian Defence Force, certainly benefited from the Bali event. You see, in the recent years before then, the falling recruitment numbers and an aging military hardware surplus with ailing morale, the Australian Defence Force had certainly seen better days. The Bali bombings in Kuta of 2002 provided the perfect excuse for an injection of funding into Australian military hardware. With an assortment of new weapons and new technology being introduced for the first time ever into the Australian Defence Force armaments. One cannot go past who benefited without mentioning the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation. Otherwise known as ASIO, they have a long history of pulling off false flags attacks in Australia to justify an increase to their budgeted funding. Many of these later have been exposed as ASIO have a checkered history of such attempts to plan and then lie about random bomb attacks, to pull off things and blame other people. Needless to mention the substantial financial boost to security companies, contractors and of course the sudden rise in demand for security experts. Likewise, in Indonesia, the ABRI, also known as the Indonesian Police and Military, have earned themselves the dubious reputation for being the most corrupt police force in the world. The military are well known for being a law unto themselves throughout the Indonesian region. In fact, the bombings and terrorist acts are hardly new to Indonesian way of life. In July of 2000, a bomb exploded at the Attorney General's office. In August of 2000, a bomb kills two and seriously injures the Philippines ambassador to Indonesia. In August of 2000, there was a grenade attack at the Malaysian embassy. And September 2000, a car bomb explodes inside the garage of the Jakarta Stock Exchange, killing 15 people. In September 2000, the police have arrested two Kopassus soldiers for the recent string of bombings. Kopassus being the special forces of the Indonesian military. As it was later revealed, these rogue elements within the Indonesian military were found to be linked to Suharto's Kopassus and had much more carnage and bloodshed planned against the Western targets. General Bin Mantoro said the pair had been detained in the Javanese city of Bandung on Sunday following the arrest of 25 suspects in Jakarta a day earlier. 
One of these suspects had even admitted that their targets were to include the United States Embassy and a Jakarta department store. With these remarkable facts in mind, and given that the U.S. Embassy on the night of the Bali bombings indeed was attacked, the chances that uh, Kapasis and the Indonesian military were involved in the Bali event are incredibly high. There is also the stunning revelation by ex-president Abdurrahman Wahid, who pointed out to SBS film crews from Australia in October 2005 that indeed it was more likely that Indonesian police and military may have played a central key role in the 2002 Bali bombings than Jamal Islamir. Before the 2002 Bali bombings, the United States had actually stopped assisting Indonesia with military hardware. For example, they supplied them with everything from F-16 fighter planes to M-16 combat rifles. But during the 90s, the spectacle of how Indonesia was using these to repress and brutalize their own people, it provoked an international outcry. The US Congress responded by cutting most military ties with Indonesia. Now, the war on terror suddenly coming to the shores of Southeast Asia had reignited the ties between the United States and the Indonesian military. And suddenly with 12 million dollars in funding and an extra 60 million dollars on the way if Indonesia agreed to pursue these terrorists, the ties between the United States and Indonesia were once again cemented. It seems that the Indonesian military certainly benefited very handsomely from Bali bombings. Let's now go through the list of those who benefited. Of course the first entity to actually benefit from the Bali bombings was the US-led coalition for their phony war on terror. Straight away all of the peace protests in Australia were suddenly ceased. All the dissent about going to war was suddenly quieted. Number two on our list includes the United States, the UK and Australian government introducing their new anti-terror laws giving sweeping powers powers of detention, powers of investigation, powers of surveillance, powers that invaded everybody's privacy for the sake of keeping us all safe. The number three beneficiary of the Bali bombings was the PNAC plan. Their resource grab was underway. Their plans to take control of Afghanistan's poppies and oil had suddenly come to fruition. Sliding in very slimily at number four, Israel. They suddenly had a lot of sympathy from countries like Australia who could relate to them suddenly getting their own terrorist attack. As Israel says, we get these kinds of things every day. At number five comes in ASIO with a huge boost in funding and more powers to play with. Likewise at number six, the Australian Defence Force with a new huge amount of funding and new military equipment. They did benefit from Bali. Number seven, the Australian Federal Police with also huge boost in funding and increased international profile. They were suddenly known as the new kids on the block who were out to bring justice to those bad Jamar Islamir terrorists. At number eight comes in the state police, the Australian states, the WA police, the Victorian police, New South Wales, Queensland, every single state police suddenly had new weapons, new toys to play with in their fight against crime and to keep these bad terrorists from invading our shores. At number nine, John Howard himself personally. His popularity definitely surged as people looked to him in a time of uncertainty. Very similar to George W. Bush after 9-11. His popularity getting a huge boost. And finally, at number 10, the Indonesian police, military and intelligence groups. They certainly had a huge boost in funding and new powers to detain and arrest people who they suspected of being terrorists. Now those people who did not benefit are the ones who got blamed. Jamal Islamir, Abu Bakr Bashir and Muslims worldwide. These people certainly did not benefit at all. A case in point, we saw the Cronulla riots, a time in Australia when anti-Muslim sentiment was at an all-time high, no doubt assisted in no small way by events like the Bali bombings. The citizens in Western nations are also the ones who did not benefit. With these new anti-terror laws and legislations, we are moving ever faster into a nightmarish scenario of George Orwell's 1984. Big Brother is now definitely watching.